Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the London School of Economics. Um, my name's Naomi. I work at the Grantham Research Institute, and it's great to welcome so many of you here tonight for our Slam Poetry Night. Um, we're joined by a really fantastic mix of artists and performers alike. And first, um, I'd like to say a big thank you to both Sabrina Mafuz, who's joining us tonight, um, and also um, to... Um, Cape, Cape Farewell, who are doing this event in partnership with us, so we're really delighted to have them here as well. So, without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over straight to Sabrina, who's going to open the event for us tonight. We've got a really great mix of poetry and performances, and um, we've got some experts who are going to come up um, and share some of their thoughts and reflections around climate change with you as well. And then we've got a slam poetry competition at the end as well. So, if you haven't already registered to take part and you'd like to, um, give one of us a shout and we can uh, sort that out for you. But in the meantime, please welcome to the stage Sabrina Mafuz. Hi. Um, so, can you hear me if I do that? Right, I'll try and do this, but this whole t thing is, yeah, a little bit difficult. Um, multitasking. Um, so, I am a poet in residence for Cape Farewell. Um, that doesn't mean that I like live there. Although that would be quite good because they've got a really cool office with a um, big view of um, the Natural History Museum. And it's really very nice there. Um, and they're always doing fun exploration type things. So I might live there one day. But um, anyway, so it just means that I kind of um, got into learning a lot about climate change, which I hadn't really known that much about before, um, despite having once worked for the Department for Energy and Climate Change. <laughs> Um, you know, how the government works, they don't really employ people who know that much about the thing they're supposed to know that much about. Um, and so I was sort of a bit overwhelmed when I first started um, researching all the things um, that I could write about. So I kind of wrote this as an introduction to myself, and now I'm going to tell it to you. So it's sort of like me talking to myself, but in a room full of people, which is a pretty accurate description of what I do as a job. So that's quite good. I want to say something, but I don't know what to say. I'm here on this stage, and there's so many things to bring into this space between me and you, so how to choose. Do I tell you about how pollution is defined in UK law as contamination of the land, water, or air by harmful or potentially harmful substances? The thing with this is, it reminds me of things that bring memories of the kind of contamination that comes from hard hearts and melting hands. No matter who you get to pay for cleaning up their mess, somehow the space remains for branches of pain to travel to all parts of a place. Like when street drains overflow and the trickles of rain are just low enough to keep the puddles the same size. Big enough to surprise you with splashes from cars with no sound, yet small enough this time to not let you drown. But then that sounds like it could be quite a depressing poem. So... Do I talk about him? The man in charge of changing policies and plans, who stands stuck to sinking sand, one arm held up by concrete promises, who makes me believe that believing in something is not something I'd recommend if that, someone, if that something is someone, but perhaps that's been done. So it could then be about why Qatar emits 36.9 tonnes of CO2 emissions whilst the African average is 0.9 tonnes. But that sounds like a whole lot of sums for a slam poetry night. I could say something about the golden days of the industrial age that has left the UK at number five in the historical emissions list and caused it to leave a carbon footprint double that of China's, despite the print it makes on a map taking up just 0.05% of Earth mass. But again, I'm not sure you came here for a history class. What about talking about what I know? That way we'll leave pretty early. I know that the UK might be reducing emissions emitted here, but we buy, buy, buy things from places that crisscross skies and seas like gangsters' cheeks well healed to push up their statistics and leave ours covered in unwanted bits of plastic that end up unbought in charity shops and permanently placed in lumps of landfill. I know there's ways to make things right, righter than they are right now anyway. There's technologies and scientists and activists and inventors who have answers to take us escalate into progress without having to undress the matter that makes us breathe. But business bosses and money loss protection officers aren't too keen to hear these solutions. Confusion over stock value and market failure, allowing them to keep the illusion that the only way to live how we live now is to live how we live now. I know that I love my city, even though it's built on the blood of empires and the ashes of slum bodies burnt in fires and plague pits and priceless bits of other people's lives. 
I know that I can never really know any of this and it's getting a bit serious for a Thursday. So maybe I should say something about the suburbs, the outskirts of the world centres, the used cars parked in the old car park of the Organ Inn, neon signs saying bargain above where the wind used to blow the bus drivers in, recycling bins placed in the wrong place. This is not the type of place where plastic disposal takes precedence over convenience. You get the sense that this has never been the right place for anything really. So how will anything really change? I look to the ceiling and think, okay, what about the bloody weather? You know it's getting wetter, getting hotter, colder, sinking, brink of land and sea kissing closer. But maybe you like Wellington boots and bikinis and these things don't bother you at all. There must be something better to say to you, make you care. But like a calligrapher working with Arabic letters, making disallowed images with elongated vowels, sometimes, somehow, a poet can make all the sounds and not really say anything at all out loud. Thanks. Um, so one, the thing that I'm doing for Cape Farewell is I'm doing a, a series of, of stories told in different forms, um, video and word art and poetry and all sorts of different things, uh, characters who somehow their lives have been affected by climate change or they will affect climate change. Um, and one of the characters, um, I'm going to read a little extract from her story. And um, she goes on to do some really positive stuff, but this bit isn't that positive. It's, it's a bit depressing, but, um, you know, there is, there is a good side to it eventually. We're just not going to hear that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's for David. David will tell us all the good stuff. Um, yeah. Gosh, this is so exposing. This is like the most exposing stage ever. Um, it feels very funny. Okay. Um, I was born in a floodplain. One of those times when the timing for new housing was just too good to miss. So the risk was calculated and it was concluded that houses with cardboard walls should be sold for gold-plated prices to people who were too poor in finances or standing to study exactly what they were investing in. My parents wanted fields. Coming as they did from sand, they saw green as a physical marker of their meritocratic rise to a perceived prominence in a country that spoke their language but was, quite loudly, never their country. It took my father a while to recognise this. Once he had, following the helping hand of a few too many letdowns, get downs, we don't want you round here's, he decided that the best way to take a country into one's heart was to take a woman of that country into one's arms and hope that the place she found inside their grasp would reciprocate a place for him in the hills of her home, despite his too brown skin and too raspy voice, shaken with sandstorms no floodplains could clear. Floodplains weren't named that way for prettiness, but for practicality. A geological fact in black and white type set on a map. Of course, this was nothing that would put off government subsidised developers whose family trees had a few branches of low-hanging MPs dangling off them. But no matter how much money was banked, the facts in black and white type set on a map remained. When it rained heavily over a long period of time, the plains flooded. And when they did, my mother had been alone. My father by that time had died. He was driving his invitation to acceptance around to the house of her parents, who would never accept him. They were arguing, she says, about the levels of humiliation her parents inflicted upon him by not allowing him past the porch, letting him watch their family dinner through diamond-shaped stained glass. She didn't think he should be so sensitive. Her father had fought a war for this country, after all. He was stuck in his ways. My father reacted in the way that men of this country never react, with hands that flung words further than the wails of funerals in his country did, leaving the steering wheel to find its way to a tree that kept my father's heart finally where it had never belonged. His new wife had to learn to walk again, and while she did that, took to sending me emails, the only person she could think of who might talk about my father. I didn't reply. The council say my mother never replied to the severe flood warning phone calls. Neighbours say the bell went unanswered. Nobody tried to break in, that would have been rude. Everyone left and assumed she must have left too. Only those with a death wish wouldn't have left, they said. Teams arrived in rubber dinghies, their noses running and their hands chapped raw, hurting from all the water that they'd pushed past their broken hearts that week. They found her on the ground floor. The water had gone down by then, but the watermarks on the wallpaper I was always embarrassed by showed that it had been brave in there. At least it had attempted to reach the ceiling. She was bloated, with the waxy skin of a drowned human whose life has been lost to the very thing that made them what they were. Hers was one of few unfortunate deaths. 
The rescue workers were shocked. Some even vomited, the report said. The report also stated that there were no suspicious circumstances, none whatsoever. The warnings had been given. The property developers had provided adequate facilities for the drainage of surface water. They couldn't be expected to provide defences against flood water in houses that were built on floodplains. They were not responsible for the tragedy. My mother had no insurance and besides, the council owned the house. I took her bloated body to London and buried her at a cemetery near me, in a city she had only been to when she stepped off a plane with a lifetime of expectation. I placed flowers there once a month. Yeah, so like I said, it, it gets happier at, at some point. Um, and uh, in September, um, I went on an expedition with, um, with Kate Farewell um, to map sea changes and drink lots of whiskey. And um, on one of these whiskey drinking times in a little boat, um, one of the other artists asked the question, if you had to choose between having no hot water or no internet, what would it be? And um, this was like quite a seemingly innocent question, but it resulted in a couple of hours of heavy debate because we hadn't had hot water or the internet on the boat. Um, and I was quite, um, <laughs> I was quite enthusiastic every time we docked to like run around and find as much reception as possible and also hot showers. Um, so they were most interested in, in my reaction as to what I would choose. So um, <coughs> this is what I told them. If you had to choose, I mean really had to choose, a world with hot, without hot water or the internet, what would it be? Now, not as easy as it first seems, is it? There's that bit of you that's thinking how good the sleeping bag snuggness of a warm water immersion is. Candlelit baths, power shower mornings, feeling brand new skin through lifting steam. But then that other bit starts screaming. What about my thoughts being retweeted, my photos being filtered, uploaded, my money being managed, my spying on people I like, my spying on people I don't like, the fight to be the earliest replying to emails, the latest awake for the vintage Chanel eBay bid, those bits of news from family, friends, countries I'd otherwise lose, confusing, searching, perching on the fence between two man-made luxuries, now necessities, and wondering how you could live. Would it be flipping worth it? My advice, this is actually what I did, sit on the top of a cliff to think about it. Waves downloaded legally to provide your dramatic soundtrack. Sunlit breeze on your face to replace the glow of screen-based ego growth. A bird colony to your right, their flight higher, more graceful than anything you could ever type. A path to your left you will leave by, stretching muscles, scratching skin with wild flowers in more colours than all the clothes you've been tagged in this decade. Taking in scenery that can never be rendered completely. Scenery that suddenly becomes so much more visible when it's not being stored to be shared. It is just so perfectly there. And so are you. Then go home, turn the hot tap on, stop yourself from logging on as skin tingles from the touch of easy water. But think about it again as refreshed you blow kisses to your niece in Dubai via Skype and feel glad that you don't really have to choose yet. So... <laughs> um, now we're going to hear from um, the people who actually know what they're talking about. Um, thanks. Thanks, Sabrina. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. So we're going to welcome up onto the stage um, some of our experts now. So if I could ask David, David and Dimitri to come and join me on stage, that would be grand. <laughs> Um, so what we thought would be quite fun to do is to mix up the bit of art, science and economics for you guys. Um, so we're joined um, on stage now um, by three various experts. So we've got David Stainforth from the London School of Economics, who's our representative climate scientist tonight. Dimitri Zengelis, who's a climate change economist with a fan club. There you go. <laughs> And then uh, to my left we have David Buckland, who's the director and an artist from Cape Farewell. <laughs> Oh, can we have a cheer for David Stainforth, please, at the far left? There we go. <laughs> so what we're just going to do for the next 10, 15 minutes is get some reflections back from these guys, um, from their sort of relative areas where they work, just to give us a bit of context and background about the sort of climate uh, change debate that we're talking about tonight. So I'm going to start with um, you, David Stainforth, if that's all right. Um, David's a climate modeler and does a lot on sort of uncertainty and, and climate science. So David, I was wondering if you could share your reflections with us um, about how the models of projecting places like the UK might be affected and can we actually trust the models? Yeah, so... <laughs> oh, OK. Um, so that, that, that's a kind of interesting question. There's, uh, people tend to focus on climate models when they're talking about climate change. There's 
an awful lot in, in the Department of Energy and Climate Change is focused on climate models. An awful lot of the science is, is based on climate models. But I think there's something of a distraction there. I, th I, I think if we're interested in climate change and questions of climate, uh, whether it's real and what we do about it, it's really a lot more important to focus on, on the science, on climate physics and, and other aspects of climate science. And climate models are really only a, a tool. They're a tool for the scientists. They're not, they're not a prediction. So in terms of what the, the models say about the future, well, they're really just a tool. You've got to filter it through something, something else. You've got to filter it through understanding. And I think something that really frustrates me is uh, uh, how the science of climate change is really not well understood, or at least among politicians. And I think that's because there's, there's kind of two types of science. There's, there's a kind of school or undergraduate science, which is, which is all about how things... Uh, science that's been built up over decades or, or centuries, science that is really well understood, science that can't really be wrong. And then there's research science, and research science can be wrong. It can, it can really be very wrong. And climate change really, that knowing that climate change exists really comes into the former. It, it, it's like throwing a ball up in the air. The question is, if the question is, does it come down, the answer is yes. And all of you would have known that. If the question is, where did it end up? Well, that's just a lot more uncertain. That's really hard to know. And so, to come back to your question, so the, the science of climate change, the science, you need longer than five minutes, but you only need 20 <laughs> minutes to go through the science of saying, okay, I don't want 20 minutes, but it only takes that long to know that climate change is a huge threat. To know what's going to happen in the UK, that's still research science. That's really, really hard. But you can still draw some conclusions. You can say, it's going to get warmer. Well, you can say more than that, because land warms up more than, than the sea, and high latitudes warm up more than lower latitudes. There's good reasons for that. Nothing to do with models. So you can say that if we kept the temperature of the planet down to an increase of two degrees, which is what politicians are aiming for, they're unlikely to get, then you're still going to be talking about at least three degrees in the UK. And three degrees, two or three degrees, don't, is a lot. Two or three degrees is a lot. 120,000 years ago, before the last ice age, we were two or three degrees warmer as a planet. And there was four to six metres increase in sea level over today. Now, that's not to say we're going to get a rapid increase in sea level. It's just that two or three degrees is a hell of a lot. And that's the sort of thing we're talking about. Um, I'm going to, yeah, so we're going to get warmer. <laughs> we're also going to get wetter, but I won't go into that one. Thanks, David. So what I suggest, if anyone's got any burning questions about climate modelling or impacts in the UK, come and grab David in, in the break. Yeah, excuse the pun. I'm going to hand over to Dimitri. Dimitri, um, what I wanted to ask you about was kind of climate policy side. So if we sort of assume that the climate change is happening, which the evidence um, shows us, what can we do about it in terms of the kind of different types of climate policy that we can use? And also, what's the UK doing, and, uh, and are we doing enough? Okay, well, there are almost certainly more questions than can be answered in five minutes. But, but it, I mean, I'd like to sort of segue um, from, from the comments you've already made about uh, modelling, because if, if modelling the natural sciences is fraught with uncertainty, then just try modelling people. And that's what economic modelling is about. And the way they try to get around that is they assume that the world is more or less doesn't change. So behaviours and res you know, um, uh, responses and technologies and institutions kind of you know, are fixed. We've got a whole set of data that talk about um, how these behaviours work and we can model them in equations and project into the future. Well, you know, we all know that economic models only get you so far even when you're looking to sort of next summer. Um, and I come from a background of economic forecasting, and I, I used to run the Treasury's economic forecast model. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Um, so, and, well, and, 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 rightly, and rightly so. And rightly so. I, I, I think that might have been Rat Snake Bob at the back, who is... Uh, um, so, and, and they, don't, you know, they don't tell you very much in the near term. They really tell you less than nothing uh, about what the world's going to look like in 2050. Why? Because, unlike the natural sciences, the human system uh, not only changes, but it changes according to how we want it to change. So the behaviours, the institutions, the technologies we go down, the infrastructure we build, the cities we build, are a function of how we decide to build them. So if we choose to move in certain directions, the world in 2050 will look very different to uh, how it might look if we choose to go in a different direction. So rather than try and model the world 
uh, in 2050, which is well nigh impossible. We're much better off trying to design it. And that's one of the lessons from modeling. What does that mean for policy? Well, it means that you need to adopt policies that try and nudge the world in a way that tries to limit the climate scientific risks. Um, the, perhaps the most effective way to do that um, is to acknowledge that the activities related to emitting greenhouse gases, particular carbon dioxide, um, are damaging, and that damage is not priced in the activities that are undertaken. So the first thing you should do is adopt a carbon price. There are various ways you can do that. You can tax or you can use cap and trade. won't have time to go into that, but you can ask me questions if you like. Um, but the important thing about carbon pricing, and the reason it's so effective, is it doesn't rely on politicians or anyone else saying, we're going to push that technology, we're going to try and make those homes efficient, we're going to try and make him or her fly a little bit less. It just says, these are damaging activities, we're going to apply a price. And that price will feed through to all consumers and producers, one way or another. And that means that consumers and producers can determine for themselves what they think is the most efficient way of reducing uh, emissions. So producers might make their production more efficient. Electricity generators might move to renewables. They might reduce waste in the grid. They might invest in technologies such as carbon capture and storage. Consumers might decide to insulate their homes. They might drive cars with smaller engines. Um, People um, who own forests might decide not to cut forests down because they can get credits, either tax credits or carbon credits for them, and so on and so forth. Nothing is manda mandated. There's no discrimination. There's no picking technologies. Um, and it covers absolutely everything. Everything that involves an emission, whether it's consumer or producer activities, is covered. So it's comprehensive uh, and it's low cost. Is it going to be enough? Well, it's going to be a very important prerequisite. It's a necessary, if not a sufficient, condition for changing the world. But there's all sorts of other reasons why pricing might not do it. You need a more strategic steer. I mentioned already that if we lock into the wrong kinds of cities, if China and India build cities that are sprawling like Phoenix and Atlanta and Minneapolis, um, you can forget trying to do something about emissions reduction. It's going to be incredibly difficult. So that's a planning decision. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs and innovators might not want to invest in the new technologies that bring down emissions, even with a carbon price, because when they do, all the knowledge they create is going to be a free good, and others will simply copy those ideas, and they won't be able to reap the benefits. So they'll underinvest, or it may require an infrastructural network, and nobody wants to be the person who pays all the money to set up the network just so others can, can join for free. So you need some additional intervention, and there's all sorts of activities which aren't very price sensitive, efficiency and waste. Now, I don't know how you guys run your lives, but mine's full of waste. Um, I just don't have time to switch my mobile phone tariffs every 10 minutes and my electricity tariff. And when I go down to buy a new fridge, I tend to buy the cheapest one with the nicest color. I don't bring a calculator and work, back, work out the payback period. Um, frankly, life's too short to run your life in the most efficient way, to find the kind of cheapest interest account. To, you know, there are so many ways. Um, so better that we just, why doesn't government just take that annoying choice out of our hands? Just give us the most efficient form of goods. Mandate that our buildings should be certain standards. Make sure that our car engines have to be certain standards. So these are non-price sensitive sectors where you need additional uh, intervention. So to answer your question, you need a lot of things and it's the set, if you like, the sum is more powerful than the parts. The most important has to be pricing. But when you've got a coherent set of policies and a government that says we're sticking to this and we're doing this, rather than sending mixed and muddled signals one minute saying we're doing it with the greenest government ever, the next minute maybe kind of undermining that for political reasons, then you get everybody acting in the same way. And if you know that your neighbours are going to act in the same way, it increases the incentive for you to act in the same way. Because if you're not the only one moving, the payoffs to moving, whether you're individual or a business or a mayor or a government, the payoffs to you moving will increase if you think everybody else is moving. So you're an innovator. China's going to go green. Jesus Christ, that's a massive market. I better invest and think about how to get new renewable technologies I can sell in that market. Um, governments will then say, Jesus, we've got all these businesses doing this. We better create a new ministry and an institution because there's a new lobby group. Uh, there's a new lobby group. The press will reflect that. Politicians will get elected for it and so on and so forth. Um, whereas if you're thinking, oh God, no one else is moving, so what if I take the risk and I go green, I'm really exposed, I'm going to have to pay all the new technologies and there may not even be a bloody market, huh, I'm going to wait. I'm not saying never, but I'll wait another year. And that's the game we're in. Everybody's playing this waiting game, this hedging game, where we know we inevitably will transform the global economy to a resource-efficient green one, but nobody wants to do it yet. And so you need leadership and a very clear and credible political signal in order to tip 
uh, that behavior into one that's consistent and coherent in transforming the economy. Thank you. Anyone would think you'd rehearse that. <laughs> David, it'd be really interesting to get your perspective from the other side, from the from the arts and creative side, um, in contrast to that. So I know, obviously, Sabrina's talked about the expeditions that Cape Farewell have done, and it'd be really helpful to get some insight from you in terms of your first-hand experience of what you've seen of climate change, but also how artists can respond and help us to tackle um, climate change and bring it to public attention. One thing you learn on these panels, never ask answer a question. <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten the question already. All right, go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, imagination. Okay, we're in the land of creativity. This room, volume of this room, is pretty much the volume of one ton of carbon dioxide by volume, by weight, by venom, by space. In one, this room, you added up all the air, replaced it with the carbon dioxide, it would weigh about a ton. Okay, every day, every day. 90 million tons, 90 million rooms like this are shoved into the atmosphere every day. And so far to date, nobody knows how to take it out. The only way to get it out of the atmosphere is Mother Nature, through its processes, will somehow, over two or three hundred years, take it out. 90 million every day, every day, every day. That's a lot of carbon dioxide. In a way, that's the science. Okay, so we've got this problem. The only way to fix it is stop putting it into the atmosphere. Now, where's Sabrina? Okay, I offered Sabrina, I said I'd come up with a surprise today. And it's sort of like, it's to do with vampires, because you know we're talking creativity. If climate change is a vampire, because in a way Dimitri's world is getting more and more <laughs> complicated, and it's getting more and more dangerous, and like, what the hell are we going to do about this horrible vampire? Well, I've got a cure to both of you. Uh, uh. <laughs> It's not gold. It's pure silver. This is a silver bullet. It's absolutely... It's, I don't... He used to work for the Bank of England. Is he safe to give him a silver? Just give me the money. <laughs> well, yeah, whatever. That silver bullet weighs seven ounces of pure silver. The current value of silver is about 20, 22 pounds an ounce, right? So that silver bullet, in terms of value, is about 160 pounds, right? Just in pure silver. Now, that is the price you have to put on carbon. <laughs> if you put that price on carbon, this is the game chamber, changer. That is the price that you have to put on a ton of carbon in order to actually change everything. It's a silver bullet, it's that simple. Now, it's not that simple because Dimitri then went on to say a few other things. And if you put a price on carbon that's less than that 160, it's greenwash. Below 120, corporations can deal with it, everybody else can deal with it, it becomes greenwash. Get it up to 160, then that's it. Now, in our lives, we produce waste, everything. You know, if I pay for you know, my dustbin, I pay for somebody to clean it up. And my water, I waste, I mean, I mess, mess it up. Somebody cleans it up, I pay them to do it. So if you're going to use the atmosphere like an open sewer for carbon dioxide, then you should pay to do it. So if you put that price on, you think, okay. So that sounds like, you know, 90 million tons times the blah, 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 blah. It's a lot of money a day that's going to start floating around, which is very interesting. Because then where do you reinvest the money? Or how do you convince everybody in this room to start paying for that? But if I sort of said, well, I could reduce your taxes a bit, then already we've got a story going. So I'm going to reduce your taxes, but I'm going to tax you on carbon dioxide emissions. And then I'm going to say, well, you don't have to pay the tax. Just don't emit anything. Get on your bike, ride an electric car, do all the good things, get on a bus, you know, it's electric, whatever. You have those choices to make. So it's the game changer. Next year, next year in Paris, it's going to be the Paris Accord, and I want the silver bullet to be all over Paris, the one decision that COP21 could make next year, because they can't make politically, you know, they're trying to get them to make a complicated treaty is going to be too difficult. One thing, silver bullet, price on carbon, 160 quid, and then let everything sort itself out. It probably will to quite a good degree but you need that one rule. And unless you have the rule, you can't, the market won't fix it, it never does. So therefore, that is art, right? Okay, silver bullet, guys. There you go, a bit of live art there. <laughs>
So hopefully our panel have stimulated some thought and discussion and some questions from you guys. What we're going to do is we're going to go to a very short 10-minute bar break so you can recharge your glasses. Please come and grill our experts. Have a chat with them. They're going to float around the room. Really happy to answer your questions. And then we're going to come back in about 10 minutes and we've got some more um, star performances for you and then a poetry slam competition as well. But please, um, many thanks so far to Sabrina and the panel. So we're going to kick off with the second half and we're going to invite some more um, poetry performances up on stage for you. So I'm going to hand over to Sabrina, who's going to introduce you to three really brilliant acts who have prepared some work specially for you tonight, okay? Dropping, dropping dice all over the place. Um, right, so who here is doing, um, taking part in the slam later on? Slammers? Oh, cheers. Woo. Anybody? Is anybody slamming? I know some of you are. One. Anyone else? Uh, two. All right, well, uh, oh, there's a few more. Well, um, the three people that are coming up uh, now, they are all champions. They have been in, in their history. They, they don't do it anymore, but they started off doing that, and um, they range from slam champions of the world. No, Europe, UK, Roundhouse, Universe. Yeah. Oh, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Um, and like the youngest ever ones and all of this kind of stuff. So um, for the people who are taking part in the slam later on, no, these are, these are the heroes. Um, so we've got Deanna. <laughs> They've all actually written the pieces that they're going to perform tonight specifically for this night. As you may have noticed from my um, set earlier, this can be quite tenuous links as to how you write about climate change, but in our heads, it makes a lot of sense, um, like how we've come to those conclusions. Um, we probably just need a lot longer to explain how that happened. Um, but first of all, we're going to have up Deanna Roger, and um, all three of these poets are some of the best in the city, and because this city is so good at poetry, that means they're some of the best in the whole world. So, um, you know, this is a good thing. And um, I think... <laughs> huh? Yeah, well, um, does anybody here like go to poetry nights? Yeah, see, no pressure at all because nobody's seen it ever before. So they'll just be like, yeah, this is obviously what the best is. And we're like, yeah, no one's going to disagree. It's all good. Um, so I'm just going to introduce them all now and then they will just come up one after the other. So first we'll have Deanna Roger, then we will have Ray Antrobus, and then we will have Zia Ahmed and um, they will do one piece each for you and then we will do Islam at which point you need to be like really noisy and like X Factor-ish and stuff like that. So um, please welcome to the stage, Deanna Roger. Thank you very much. Hello. So um, as Sabrina mentioned, yeah, like it kind of kick spurred me on. I'm writing a, a show at the moment about, um, about darkness and light and it kind of feeds into artificial light and how much light we use in London and in cities and why um, and so and so like with this in mind and that in mind I wrote this um, so it's an excerpt from my show um, and I'm not going to give you an introduction to the seven pages that went before it but you'll just get this also I did train as an actor so I can project so I'm going to put down the mic um, <laughs> Okay. The futurist movement has influenced our approach to technological advancements as po positive progressions. In cities, public lighting is a norm, with an estimated 7.5 million streetlights in the UK and the global lighting industry is expected to be worth 100 billion euros by 2020. We spend an extortionate amount of time and money researching, experimenting and marketing like despite having 12 hours of it. London never seems to sleep. What type of light are we searching for? Charging the city, bold proximity, cinemas in the day, restaurants all night, darkness swallowed, no natural light, no fate, switch controlled and it's beautiful, the street lights shine bright so the sky is lit all night, no rest. No respite, no relief, no silence, no stopping, none of that reflective shite. The shite that makes you blind and fly too high from home. Here is where I belong. 
On an earth that sparkles like a tinsel bauble, where seeing is 24 hours and universal light is dethroned. Suntan, sunbeds, sundial, clocks, weather, TV news or phone app, everything you ever need to know, iPad, computer, laptop screens, comfort dreams with incessant beats. There's no nothing to be afraid of if you can always see. So I'm tripping off this light. Broadway billboards, trains, tubes, the lights don't flicker like they used to. There are reassuring alarms every few yards. There's no need to stop. We glow in the dark, man-made stars shoot shadows. No need to sleep anymore. Speeding cars flash lights on bright indicate that these days stretch round everlasting in this electricity. This safe, controlled, electric city. A futurist artist called Giacomo Bala painted the street light, the study of light. This painting was inspired by the concept of artificial light dominating the natural light of moonshine. But despite us harnessing the power of artificial light, only stars produce natural light. They are a superheated state of matter. There are no two stars the same, like no two days, like no two people. Some stars look like they are touching. These stars exist in binary systems. They are miles apart, that, but they are connected and they mutually orbit each other. There's some science that suggests that we, humans, are made from the same properties as stars. I no longer trust the stars. Those lights hold the earth beneath them, tilting their arrogant noses and peering down at humanity like we are a small child. There's nothing to see, they say. There's nothing for you to know, they say. So I murder the moonshine with this flashy guy by my side, buying everything money can buy. In defiance, cause I hate the naturalness of recycling. New everything. I need new everything. I hate the rough improvisation of nature. I need order and control. Concrete that road. Let no weeds grow through. Faithful in their photosynthesis, let them die. Cut down those trees, I can't see. See, I need it cleared. Don't walk on the grass. Shoes at all times. Eyes down. Time is watched, taken, monitored, kept. Be on time. Never lose track of time. It's in digits on the wall. Put it in your pocket. Wear it on your wrist. See how the light sparkles the gold that cages it. The gold rescued from the dark pits of earth and brought under spotlights and magnifying glass because that's what it deserves. It deserves to be seen on show, like clothes in every shop window. Let them glow all night. Stop walkers walking past. Shoot desire through the glass. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, that was Diana Roger. Jesus, that was amazing. Was what was that you were performing tomorrow? Do you want to do that? Do you want to say that now? She's performing tomorrow. She's amazing. It's at the Albany in Deptford. Cool. Um, wow. No, no pressure. First, Sabrina's like, these are the best poets in the world, and then put me on, on. All right, wicked, amazing. So this is um, a poem uh, that was asked to write about climate change, and um, I really struggled with it, and I thought, okay, there's this poetic form which I discovered when you write a poem, and then you criticise yourself for writing it, and I thought that would be a good thing to do for a political poem. Okay, it's called Ode... To Owen. Green budget halved. In the grip of a man who shakes more hands than he holds. Who knows the slash better than the marks they leave on the ground. Blame the Chinese power stations. India, America. Responsibility is a foreigner with a name pronouncing pollution. Oh, Owen. Tell the men with castles that they need canoes. Lie to their tears when it's too late to stop the flood. There is violence in truth. When it hits, it wins and fires the stomach. We're sucking too much turbulence from our whirling failure. Who isn't frightened of what rips doors 
and uproots houses. <laughs> Question one. Can writing poems about climate change change anything? Answer. The first draft of this poem was called Ode to Owen Peterson. <laughs> yes. His name is Owen Patterson. Ignorant poets writing about political issues need to research and channel their education through poetry. Question two. What will I do with my educated opinion now I have written a political poem? Whew. The evening I wrote this poem, I fell asleep in the kitchen of my shared flat, leaving the heat and all the lights in the house blaring. And when my flatmate came home to ask what I was doing, I said, writing a poem about climate change. <laughs> my educated opinion has intensified my guilt about this incident. Question three, really though, what are you going to do? I have signed anti-climate change cuts on someofus.org, 38 degrees and change.org. I will participate in protests and not shy from confrontation with climate change skeptics. It's about the facts. Speaking of facts, I'm a teacher. By 2016, climate change will be removed from the UK national curriculum. When I told my mother this, she said, isn't the national curriculum the most dangerous form of censorship? Fact. If more people thought like my mother, there would be no Pattersons, no Goves. Actually, 98% of people probably do think like my mother. Thank you. I am the uh, cool. I can't get out of my head. I've just been sleeping. I can't get out of my bed. I need to eat things. I open the cupboard, a packet of fig rolls and a can of Vimto. I haven't left the house for a couple of days. I've got the TV on, got the radio playing. Songs that remind me of you. I open the fig rolls and try to watch the news. I stare at the telly. Politicians pretending to care in their wellies. <laughs> I want to send you a text. Don't you'll say something you regret. Just think of something else. I won't blame it on myself. I'll blame it on the weatherman. You can't blame this shit on Michael Fish. Broken hearts and flooded paths. We your government. Yes, we accept these floods might be related to climate change. Most probably, highly likely. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going to do all of the good things. But you, the people, you need to watch your carbon footprint. It's mainly your fault. They always pass these things down. I look round the house. Got the TV on, got the radio playing songs. That I turn the radio off. <laughs> Fair enough. If we do the little things, what about the big stuff? I eat another fig roll. <laughs> Open the Vimto, stare at my phone. Mate, seriously, leave it alone. Sip of the drink, go on computer, click on a link. They like to blame it on the other sides and say the grass ain't much greener on the other side because we're much cleaner than the other sides. Like China. <laughs> oh my God. There's so many people. Have you seen all the smog? They all drive cars and I feel for them because they don't get to go to the park when it's real dark. Lay back on the grass and just gaze at the stars. Plus, their Olympics weren't as good as ours. <laughs> Team GB. Also, they've all just started to eat meat at the same time. <laughs> it's insane, all of the methane produced to make their beef steaks. Our beef steaks bring all the boys to the yard. 
and they're like, it's better than yours. <laughs> and our cows, our cows belch nice gas. <laughs> another sip of the drink, another click of the link. I'm British, so let's talk about the weather. <laughs> it's a way of breaking the ice. I'm British, but I'll mention climate change and how it's melting the ice. Why are you such a downer? London's going to be hotter than IB for this weekend. Whoa. <laughs> this, guy, this guy is like, since 2000, the UK's had its five wettest years and its seven warmest. And there's a higher risk of flooding. There's clear evidence to support this. A warmer atmosphere contains more water, causing more intense rainfall. This and higher sea levels in the English Channel means... I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'd like to introduce to the panel, in the interest, in the interest of balance, <laughs> an old rich guy with some kind of title and an interest in the Bible, a fossil into fossil fuels. <laughs> We'd really like to hear your views. He's like, sometimes it's hot. Sometimes it's not. <laughs> I don't agree with these patterns. This time it rained a lot and it took a while for the rain to stop. Shit happens. <laughs> another link, another link, another link. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the wet gets wetter and the dry gets drier and the warm gets warmer and sea levels get higher and cold plunge lower forest on fire like a funeral pyre rock paper scissors blood is thicker than water oil is thicker than blood water is quicker than both and when you get hit with a flood your feet will stick in the mud you can't move stuck in a rut feeling under the weather you you want to do things to make you feel better and it all comes undone when all of a sudden a flood will just come and you're submerged and it's hurt and you examine the ruins, feel like it's all been mostly your own doing, beat yourself up, go round in circles, why buy a burglar alarm when you've already been burgled, it won't make a sound because the power's gone out, acid rain just splashing brain and my mind's fried, why try? in hindsight but right now there's no right side wrong side feeling a strong tide you want to leave something behind whatever it be she wants to leave a poem he wants to leave a family something tangible and substantial and I will everyone will we all leave this 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 planet and sometimes I can't stand it but it's the reflection of self meets projection of self and I don't know if I believe in the heaven or hell but this is all real. It's this earth, it's me, it's you, it's us and I don't want to fuck it up. I just want to leave the best version of me. Cool, thank you. <laughs> Um, so I just think like that was really, I um, want to say a massive well done again to Deanna Roger, Ray Antrobus and Zia Ahmed. Thank you so much. <laughs> now we're going to do the slam. So um, whoever registered to um, slam and those who didn't but now have just written something in their minds, please um, come and join Naomi and... Um, we look forward to hearing your words. I don't know what happens in this bit. Oh, they're just going to come up. Okay, okay, cool. Right, so who we got first? Drum roll. Hello, what's your name? My name is Richard Wright. Richard Wright. This is, uh, yeah, Richard, go for it. Thanks. Okay, right, thank you very much. Um, 
I'd like to thank GRI. Uh, I guess you've all been getting emails from GRI. I've got a, a friend in Denmark whose name is G-R-Y, and so I, I keep thinking I'm getting emails from her. Anybody here from Denmark? They told me they don't pronounce her name. I think it's because they don't actually want to, because G-R-Y is pronounced, it sounds like clearing your throat. It's <laughs> um, Anyway, thank you to GRI. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of open mics. It gets me a chance to tell my grandchildren that I read poetry with Sabrina Mafuz and three extraordinary poets. Uh, and, and then you've got me, and I hope um, it gets better and better. Um, I'm allowing myself the time to amble like this because I write sonnets. Oh my God. And they don't take very long. A sonnet takes about 20 seconds at the rate I speak. Um, I'm sneaking in two of them. I had to tell the organizers I was reading a work. So there's a double sonnet. Do not clap after the first sonnet or they'll take me off. Um, so you have to be like at some fancy concert where there's movements and, and, and people look to see if anybody's going to clap so they can feel superior. I, I've never needed mechanisms to feel superior, but anyway. Um, right, so two sonnets on climate change. Shipping forecast. The general synopsis for now, UTC. I issued gale warnings, sea area white, but you were too busy to listen to me. So now, gales from Iceland to the German Bight. We'll see how you like it when I really try. The wind is southwesterly, gale force severe. The sea's in a sea state, the waves very high. The weather cyclonic, depression is near. Visibility? will rather quickly be poor. An imminent hurricane in Bay of Biscay. The pressure is falling from Dover to Forth. Phenomenal wave heights are coming your way. Sea area Thames and Humber and Tyne. Gale force, very rough. And hurricane, fine. Suffering, very good. Suffering sea changes. <laughs> History is not just one thing than another. Climate is more than just shipping forecasts. Climate is language which we can decipher from murmuring streams to hurricane blasts. Climate is language and weather is speech. The wind has a message. The water is spouting. The facts are placing themselves within reach. Climate is language. The weather is shouting. There's water knee deep in my kitchen today, and they ask me, they ask me, do you believe? The rain raineth down, I may need to pray. I'm beyond believing, I see what I see, and I do not need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, by the way, these, these are um, very brave people who have just um, signed up to just come and perform tonight, something that maybe they've never performed before or um, anything like that. So it's really important that we give them really big claps, it, unless they ask us not to, like you did. Um, but that was really great. Thank you very much. And um, so, hello. This is really like this little... Do you want to sit down on the sofa or something? I feel like... Standing there, right, sorry, go, go for it. What's your name? Andrea Spisto. Hi. Um, now, I know I'm small um, and frankly adorable. Uh, <laughs> this poem is neither small nor adorable, but it is frank. So. Something is wrong. Just use your senses. Instead of using those colored lenses, those false pretenses, they are just offenses. Open your mind and the journey commences. Every day we're ignoring our instincts. 
We're looking at these faces, worried about defining races, frustrating a lack of inspiration, reality leaking out only in moderation. Escapism is the name, devalued life with no gain. A gift corrupted, a mind usurped. I need to stop and ask myself, what is going on? This life gifted with every color, shape, and beauty given to us. Air unearned, fruit undeserved, fellowship, stars, rich land, and precious life. Ever-present, misguided gratitude, lacking latitude, basking in murky clarity, wrong idea of what is sanity, what it means to not suffice with days in and days out, punching in, time to kill, a purposeless, uncomfortable existence. There is no need to follow the misinformed generation, the pained souls with no questions beaten down by our choice to agree to this misunderstood agreement of our past's overachievement. We are helping to cut, break, unravel the irreplaceable value of life. You can buy another drink. You can buy a brand new sink, a phone that is now pink, a perfume to cover the stink, this season's dead mink. You don't stop to think how it all links and now we're on the brink. We can't buy another planet and it's debatable that our children's children will even have it. But the rhythm can change. This dance can be fruitful and fulfilling. The water can be clear and colored with artistic qualities of life within. Laughter which is found without pain. Underwater view of calming ocean rain. A warm impression. A fight diffused. A dog's excitement that pushes you down and grounds you. The sound of honeybees swarming through the trees shouldn't become a thing of folk stories. I know it sounds like one big mess and stress, but there is freedom found in the light of awareness. Thank you. <laughs> That really was amazing. Um, so I'm gonna change up the tempo a little. Um, hi, sorry, I'm Maria uh, Carvalho. I'm part of... <laughs> uh, I'm one of those PhD students from GRI. Uh, it's a group of people. Uh, so sorry about all the spam emails. No, it's all good, it's all good. Um, when I thought of writing this poem, I actually had it in my mind for a long time, but I wanted to write it for uh, my little cousins and nieces and nephews. Um, and so, with that in mind, this is for children. Um, I kind of changed some of the content so it would be more appropriate for you guys. But um, the title, as you can see, is for children. It's called The Rockaboo Family Adventures. On the distant Isle of Antarctica, Far, far away, the Rockaboo family anticipated about going on a holiday. Oh, Mrs. Mr. Rockaboo, I need a vacation. All work and no play does not keep the blues at bay. Ah, well, Mrs. Rockaboo, a vacation, you say. A vacation in which nation? To go on a holiday. I want to relax. I need to relax. Sipping some wine would seem mighty fine. Wine, you say? Well, I know the perfect place. The vineyards of Wales produce some fine Beaujolais. <laughs> Wales has the perfect climate to grow those juicy grapes. It has that lovely Mediterranean weather, so even the sheep don't grow their own sweaters. Ah, Mr. Rockaboo, you're completely right. Bordeaux and Tuscany was so last century. Their soils are dry, for rain they cry. The poor farmers got there can't grow anything anywhere. Well, but what about you, Mr. Rockaboo? Where would you like to go? Sitting around drinking wine is not you, I know. Well, Mrs. Rockaboo, I would like an adventure. 
An underwater sea excursion is my holiday version. Ah, there are some lovely cities to visit where we can go on diving expeditions. Amsterdam, New Orleans, Venice, Dhaka are the new underwater meccas. What a brilliant idea! But how do we get there? There are no more flights since the last climate strike. Ah, uh, do not worry, Mr. Rockaboo. The ice is fully gone. We can e sail easily from the South Pole under the summer sun. Ah, we'll take a cruise ship to anywhere you want to go. You can drink your fine wine, and I'll dive in the seas below. It's so wonderful to live in Antarctica in this 22nd century. For those who are near the equator, well, we are really sorry. But those are the breaks when it comes to climate change. Some win, and many, many, many lose. Why do you find it so strange? Hello, I just happened to have uh, written this for no particular reason, then I looked on the Poetry London website and um, it, it, a little bit to do with climate change and um, I used to be a student here about 40 years ago so I thought I'd come down. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, um, 14th February 2014. It is cruel, cruel February and the floods are still rising. Hearts flowers have been carefully signed, sealed, but cannot be delivered. They will never arrive. All roads are underwater. Boats are leaking. The ground is caving in. Nothing can any longer function as it should. Faint sounds from the bottom of a garbage bin where a kitten has been flung unwanted. Helpless rage ballooning, spiralling up into a toxic whirlwind of effluent overflowing drains submerging houses. Dear old dad, or what remains of him, slumps desolate in the acrid glow of television light. Somebody else chose the programme. They have taken the control. He watches without seeing, hears without listening. Dutiful, supercilious keepers stuff him with carefully prescribed poison at precise, exact times of day, congealing their hearts against his feeble protestations. They return home satisfied at the end of their shifts which does not stop the phantom seeping sideways downwards, upwards, upwards, up, 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 out of the sewers, up into the darkened sky, falling down as splinters of cold rain lashing the sea, ripping up rail tracks, smashing seawalls, obliterating years of painstaking history. You can walk down the street in the chilly evening, startled suddenly as a stranger speaks, pierces you with sudden laser gaze, reading a state of mind which you didn't even know you had, let alone that it showed on your face, inviting all and sundry to comment on. It's as if they know, but of course they don't. The old lady died alone. It was three months before they found her. Neighbours eventually alerted by the smell. Once the older relatives had gone, and friends and neighbours got so busy, 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 nobody cared to phone or visit her. They just forgot. The bleeding hearts, the bleeding hearts, are sealed in envelopes which have been posted, but will never arrive. Hate emanates from explosives hidden in backpacks, hidden in your underpants, you little piece of shit, concealed in your shoe, you stinking little toe rag. Aeroplanes blossom into flowers of destruction, passengers tumbling, screaming to earth. The kitten is still mewling underneath the rubbish, fainter now, fur is rain-soaked, body temperature dropped, but it still takes far, far too long to die. Bleeding hearts lie silent in their envelopes. Will there be any flowers this spring, or have they all been drowned? Thank you. Hello, I'm not quite sure why I came along this evening, except it seemed like a bit of a busman's holiday, because I worked as a civil servant on climate change, and I write poetry occasionally when I have the time. And um, I wrote this poem about four years ago, actually. I think work was getting to me. And I called this poem Any Old Tires. And I called it that because when I was a child and the rag and bone man used to come down our London street collecting the rubbish to recycle, he would cry out, Any Old Iron? So this is taking that and taking it a bit further. 
and um, apologise to the funny voices. I'm not used to this. Um, this is a transcript from Human Life on Earth, our new documentary series to be launched in Rain Month 2500 by Professor Daisy Attenborough, University of the European Archipelago. <coughs> this was the age of the wheel and the tires. Centuries later, we still find them rising, working their way up through topsoil and sand to surface and float on surprising ground. Our satellites, reading beneath Earth's skin, on this setting, show them as tiny red rings, pockmarks marking the edge of old cities, forgotten ring roads, and flattened valleys. This was an era before the seas rose, before our islands, before we floated on air with sun power and sailed in the billowing winds. An age when tires were pressed from fossil oil in billions. An era where engines and tires burned petrol, where movement and travel was friction and struggle of vulcanized rubber on black toffee tarmac, where millions of tires daily were worn and discarded. They piled them in mountains, they threw them in furnaces, and as the sea climbed, the tires found new uses. They buffered their bridges, protected their cities, were lashed into lines to make the waves smash. And now, from our orbit, we see them as stretched scars, surgical wounds with their faded stitch marks. And now the camera submerges, explores these poignant pyramid walls of old tires. And we watch as the sea rocks these ruins of ages. A giant crab crunches through concrete and cables. Then one tire breaks free and it rises and floats, a symbolic survivor of primitive cultures. Thank you. Um, so we're just going to confer for a couple of minutes. I don't know what happens in, in that time. I guess you, you, you drink. Um, and then we'll be back in a second to announce the winners. <laughs> what do they win again? Uh, it's £50 of theatre vouchers for pr first prize and £25 for the runner-up. But a huge round of applause. Thank you so much. Obviously, it's all great. And we really appreciate that you, that you came and performed those for us. It definitely added a lot to the evening, didn't it, everybody?